For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. Welcome to the World of Antiquity channel. I'm David Miano, and I'm answering voicemails. Let's give one a listen. Hello, this is Lee. My question is about the Sumerian cuneiform script. Is there a Rosetta Stone-like artifact that helped decipher it? Or is it a collaboration of several scholars over the years to help decipher the script? Thank you, Lee. A good question. For those of you who don't know, and as Lee indicated, cuneiform is a script. It's a way to write a language, but it's not a language itself. In fact, in ancient times, cuneiform was used to write a number of languages. Sumerian, Akkadian, Hittite, Hurrian, and others. After the Phoenician alphabet was invented, a system that was way more efficient and economic, cuneiform gradually was abandoned. And over the centuries, those who knew how to use it all died off. The decipherment of cuneiform began in the 19th century with the study of Persian inscriptions. The kings of the Achaemenid Empire liked to put cuneiform on their monuments. This had not been the practice of the earlier Mesopotamians, who used it primarily on clay tablets. The Persian monuments were largely accessible at the time and in pretty decent condition. Typical inscriptions were trilingual, written in three languages, and in that sense, Rosetta Stone-like. The first of these three languages was, like the others, in wedge-shaped writing, cuneiform, except that it was alphabetic, although some signs were logograms. Some 43 signs were employed. Decipherment of that was started largely by a German scholar by the name of Georg Friedrich Grotefund, who started the process by recognizing proper names in the text and typical royal expressions. He revealed his findings in 1802. His work was refined and expanded by others after him. Uh, one was a Danish scholar, Rasmus Rask, who in 1826 demonstrated that the language was related to Sanskrit. We classify it now as Old Persian. The second language on the inscriptions is New Elamite. It contained over a hundred signs and thus was determined to be syllabic rather than alphabetic. That is, each sign represents a syllable instead of a letter. This form of writing and language still is largely obscure and not as much work has been done on it as the other two. Okay, so we've got Old Persian and we've got New Elamite. So now let's turn to the final language in these inscriptions. This is written in Mesopotamian cuneiform, the one I assume you're asking about. Probably the most notable early scholars that worked on the decipherment were Edward Hinks and Sir Henry Rawlinson, who separately worked on all three scripts. In fact, although each was helped by the work of the other, they appear to have been somewhat competitive. Sometimes you'll hear that the Behistun inscription was the Rosetta Stone for the decipherment of Mesopotamian cuneiform which was used by Rawlinson to work it out. But it's not really true. Rawlinson concentrated on the trilingual inscriptions at Mount Elwand, near Hamadan, which he copied in 1835. Later, he will also use the Behistun inscription, but it wasn't really the key that unlocked everything. Many inscriptions were used. Plus, Rawlinson tends to get most of the credit, while Hinks often gets forgotten. They both noted that the third script in these trilingual inscriptions had far more signs than even the New Elamite script. And they each concluded that it must be syllabic in nature, each sign representing a syllable. In 1846, they both published papers making this known, not knowing that the other had discovered it too. Hinks announced that he had determined the language to be similar to known Semitic languages, and that it was related to the cuneiform found on the many tablets that had been unearthed in Mesopotamia. It was the language of the Assyrians and Babylonians, which we now call Akkadian. At first, the only way that the sounds of cuneiform signs could be ascertained was by looking at the way known proper names were written. Hinks was able to find the name Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, written in many inscriptions. He also identified the first word that wasn't a proper name, the first person pronoun, Anaku. Hinks figured out that a sign representing a consonant and a vowel could be followed by a sign representing a vowel and a consonant to create a single syllable of a consonant-vowel consonant. 
He also was able to work out correspondences between two ways of writing a sign, which he called cursive and lapidary. Nevertheless, the extreme variety of the signs and peculiar features of the writing system, including an evolution in practice, made the script very difficult to decipher. And the works continued after Hinks and Rawlinson to the end of the 19th century through the discoveries of scholars like Friedrich Delich, Benno Landsberger, and Wolfram von Soden. But what about Sumerian? Once the basics of the cuneiform system were worked out, it became possible for scholars to tackle also other languages that used the system. As early as 1849, Hinks had argued that the inventors of the cuneiform script could not have been the speakers of Akkadian or any Semitic language, because, as he said, no Semitic people could have invented a system of writing so uncongenial to their language. A heated controversy took place after Hink's death between a scholar named Joseph Halevi, who argued that the Sumerian language and people didn't exist, and a scholar named Jules Oppert, who did. Various scholars took sides. It wasn't until the 20th century that Sumerian was finally understood to be a different language. Previously, they thought it was just a special way of noting Akkadian. But the strange character of the Sumerian language and the fact that there was no known language related to Sumerian made it very difficult to work out. There was no Rosetta Stone for this undertaking. What helped scholars to decipher it was the collection of grammatical lists and vocabularies that priests of Mesopotamia had made of the language. They had largely done this in later periods when Sumerian was no longer spoken and they wanted to preserve knowledge of it. Scholars involved in the decipherment of the Sumerian language uh, were the aforementioned Friedrich Delich, Francois Thoreau d'Angin, Arnaud Poubel, Anton Diemel, and Adam Falkenstein. Today, we can read Sumerian quite well. I hope that answers your question sufficiently. If anyone else would like to leave me a question on my voicemail, you can do so at speakpipe.com slash David Miano. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. This is a community-supported channel, so if you want to help keep it alive, visit patreon.com slash worldofantiquity and become a patron for as little as $2 a month. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left the link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.